for the next half an hour to the oceans. And if I may ask you, would you mind to stand up, everyone, for a moment? And if you like, close your eyes. Imagine you would be standing on a nice beach, on a shoreline, maybe on a cliff where we have been in the past or where we, we, you would like to be in the future. And now feel the ocean. Hear the waves. Feel the air. Smell and taste the salt. And now breathe with me. Breathe in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out every second breath we take every second oxygen molecule comes from the ocean and please have a seat again if you want and this oxygen we all depend on is being produced by these little fellows called phytoplankton what you see here is a condensed sample taken with a plankton net and these little organisms they produce as much and even more oxygen as all terrestrial plants on earth combined the difference is these are tiny organisms the largest ones you see here maybe have a size of 100 micrometers one micrometer is the millionth part of a meter and nevertheless they are so important for us because they fulfill the wonder of life what they do is they transfer anorganic mi minerals just by using the power and the radiation of the sun to organic biomass the wonder of phytosynthesis and like this, they form the basis of almost every marine food web. Because the energy and the biomass they produce then is being transferred by a second plankton group, which is called zooplankton, to so-called higher trophic levels. And these zooplankton organisms are also quite small organisms. Most of them reach only a couple of millimeters in size. And by the way, Zooplankton shows the largest migration of biomass in the world. It's not zebras, it's not news, it's not birds, it's these little organisms. And they do it twice a day, because during the day they hide in the deeper water column where it's dark from predators. And at night they ascend to the surface where then they feed on phytoplankton. And the most important copepods, uh, most important zooplankton class are copepods. You see one species here on the top right, also only a couple of millimeters in length. And they are so important because especially in marine systems, they build the link between our friends down there, the phytoplankton and higher trophic levels that are also important for us, like for example, fish or other seafood because it's over 3 billion people in the world who depend on fish and seafood as a food source, as a source for proteins. What you see here in this food web is that there are also alternative so-called food chains. You see that there is a so-called gelatinous food chain, not leading to fish, but leading to jellyfish. And what we observed since many years ago is that a shift occurs from this fish food chain to jelly food chain in different marine systems. This is from a survey we conducted over 20 years ago in the Mediterranean. And depending on the warming of the water, on fertilization, meaning nutrient load and nutrient stichometry, and a high reproduction rate these jellyfish has, a shift occurs from fish to jellyfish, which sometimes is not reversible. And for nature, for such a food web, you may say, well, it's an alternative stage. For us as human beings, it might cause problems because we depend on this food and the system of the ocean in general. And in ecology and ecological economics, we're talking here about ecosystem services. We differentiate between providing services, supporting services, 
regulating services and cultural services. And I would like to give you one example for each of these categories from the ocean. The first one I just explained, we depend on the food from the ocean to feed the world. And maybe it's also a good time to thank the ocean for that and say, thank you, ocean, if you want. Thank you, ocean, for providing us uh, with the food we need uh, for our daily lives. A regulating ecosystem service is climate regulation. The ocean has taken up around 30% of carbon dioxide emissions we have emitted since Industrial Revolution. And this goes along with an absorption of 90% of the heat human beings have generated in the same period of time. 90%. To make it better understandable for you, the ocean over the last century has risen in temperature by 0.1 degrees centigrade down to a depth of 2,000 meters. This does not sound a lot, but if the ocean wouldn't have to take up the seat, air temperature would have risen in the same period by 36 degrees centigrade. Actually, this would mean life for us physiologically would not be possible on Earth in most regions on our globe. So thank you, Ocean, for preventing us from being boiled and taking up the seed and taking up greenhouse gas emissions. Another supporting ecosystem service is one you just experienced breathing together, it, the provision of oxygen. And what you see here is different satellite images showing the distribution of phytoplankton across the ocean. And what you see, phytoplankton is not distributed homogeneously, it's heterogeneously. Because, like every plant on Earth, also phytoplankton, they need a certain temperature, they need light, they need nutrients, and there are also other aspects. But if one of these three categories is not fulfilled, phytoplankton cannot grow. And therefore, as you have learned already, the entire food web does not function. And this is why you see these blue areas in the ocean that are comparable to deserts in the Earth system, where you have low biomass and a different kind of ecosystem. And then there is another ecosystem service, a cultural aspect, uh, which includes recreational aspects, spiritual aspects, maybe also artistic aspects, important for different kinds of cultures. And I hope for you that everyone has experienced the well-being and the good feeling we have visiting the ocean. So thank you, Ocean, also for providing this service for us. As you can imagine, there is also another side of the coin. And I would like to explain you now for the same ecosystem services what challenges we face. Provisioning of food. What you see here, the red line, is the development of captured fish over the last decades. And you see that since the late 80s, we have reached a so-called saturation curve, meaning actually we have overexploited or at least brought to a limit most of the commercially used fish stocks. Indeed, it's more than 90%. It's 30% that we have overexploited and it's 60% that we have brought to a limit. And this is why you see the other line, the blue line, we try to compensate this with aquaculture because we need the source fish and seafood to feed the world. And you see that only a couple of years ago, the production of fish and seafood from aquaculture has exceeded the one we capture from the sea. But there is also a connection because aquaculture is not independent from marine resources. We need fish oil, we need fish meal to produce fish feed to run these aquacultures. And this is a huge challenge. There are some first solutions. I will show you one later on. But in this case, unfortunately, we have to say sorry, Ocean, that we overexploit these resources, which of course is also a problem for us as human beings. The same is the case when we're talking about climate regulation. The absorption of CO2 and heat also has its price. And what you see here, I suppose, is familiar to most of you, coral bleaching. Warm water corals, they live in symbiosis with small algae called zooxanthelles. 
And once the temperature in the ocean has reached a certain degree, they lose the symbionts, meaning the coral dies. It's still beautiful to see, but it's dead. And we are heading towards a situation once we have reached 1.5 degrees centigrade global warming, we probably will lose most of the coral reefs, the warm water corals, they're also cold water worlds, but the warm water coral reefs. And there are also other challenges like, for example, ocean acidification has risen by 30% over the last decades, like, for example, change of currents, so-called thermohaline circulation that again influences our weather patterns on Earth. And there are a lot of other challenges that are interrelated. And this is also a challenge to understand how these systems work holistically and what dynamics lie behind. Next challenge, we were talking about how important the production of oxygen is for us. But the ocean has lost, due to global warming, like 2% of the solved oxygen in the water. When water temperature rises, the solubility of oxygen decreases. And this is why we find, in the meanwhile, a lot of regions in the world that are so-called hypoxic or anoxic reasons, uh, regions meaning O2 concentrations are so low that, for example, in the red and purple areas, even fish cannot exist anymore. And these zones, some call them dead zones, are rising. So this is another issue related to global warming, but it's also related, for example, to over-fertilization, to exceeded influence of nutrient load and nutrient stoichiometry. So sorry, ocean, again, what we do here. And again, it's also a problem for us. And talking about cultural ecosystem services, we also all exceed here in many cases. This is an example for so-called over-tourism that is harmful not only for the ocean, but also for other systems. And I suppose this is not really relaxing anymore also to, to be here in such a setting. So what I asked myself over the last years and decades always is why do we act like we do? Because I think it's important to understand the background, the rationale behind to find also approaches for solutions. And I would like to share a couple of thoughts I have on this. And the list I will show you now, it's an open list. It's not complete, but maybe it gives us some inspiration because as I said, once you understand what the challenges are, you can also start to find solutions. So reasons for mismanagement and overexploitation, like we've seen at the moment, include a biased economic system. So maybe some of you have heard of the tragedy of the commons and externalities we have not internalized in our economic system, coming along with misleading subsidies and taxation. And this again, an example from fisheries. Most people don't realize the fish in the ocean is for free. It has no price. What fishers pay for is the so-called fishing effort. You need a vessel, you need the gear, you need stuff, you need to market what you've caught, but the fish is for free. It does not, has no value in differentiation, for example, to aquaculture. In addition, there are a lot of subsidies that fuel unsustainable systems like, for example, fisheries. Also in the European Union, we pay a lot of money to keep fisheries running where they are not sustainable, as I've shown you before. And this is a social political challenge we have to solve to direct money again into channels where it can help us become more sustainable. And this goes along also with legislation. Um, this is an example from this year. After many years of debates and discussion, finally, we have formulated a framework to protect the high seas. The high seas, so to say the open ocean, and so far only 1% of it is legally protected. The goal by the UN High Seas Treaty is to protect 30% of it by 2030. 
Here it is also important not only to protect 30%, but also to take care that it's had that, that protected areas have a high quality. Unfortunately, this now has to be transferred also into national laws. And this is a process that I suppose will take quite a time, but at least we have set a framework. And the same is true for subsidies, by the way. Uh, the World Trade Organization has also formulated an agreement where it tries to avoid harmful subsidies, but its members have to agree. And it has to be at least 110 countries that agree. At the moment, it's like 34, 35. So also there is still some way to go to make these frameworks legally binding. Then there is a completely different aspect, and this is, as I call it, greed. Unfortunately, as human beings, evolutionary maybe developed, um, we are quite selfish, and this is also true for many companies. And what you see here is a manganese nodule. They are very rich, not only in manganese, but also in other raw materials, and you find them normally in the deep sea, between 4,000 and 6,000 meters deep. And it has become economically attractive and technically feasible to harvest them. The issue here is we don't know what we're doing because we don't know anything actually about the deep sea. We have explored only 0.0001% of the deep sea floor. We know more about the moon than about the deep sea. And yet we start to try to harvest these nodules and we don't know what we are doing. In addition, these nodules, this one has maybe a diameter of 15 centimeters, grow over millions of years. This nodule maybe has an age of 15 million years. So again, we don't understand what we are doing here. Now it comes to us as individuals, because of course, with our consumption patterns, we also influence not only our marine systems, but also other natural systems. And just to give you a figure, 90% of the goods we consume are transported using ships and containers. And in my opinion, maybe it's also 90% of the, these goods we actually don't need for a good life quality. And here we are, have to ask ourselves on a daily basis, what do we need for a good life quality? And maybe what don't we need? Um, and here we have really the possibility to also contribute, um, taking pressure from the oceans. Another aspect is, from my experience, that many of us have lost the connection to the ocean, even though we come from the ocean, and that we have a biased focus. I like polar bears, I admire them, but for the functioning of our ecosystems and providing ecosystem services we depend on, they are, for example, not as important as the phytoplankton or the zooplankton we have seen. And we have to start to understand how these systems work and what is important to protect and what options we have to use the system sustainably. And sometimes hybrids comes here along. We think we understand things, but we don't. And I explained to you before that we have a lack of understanding. I explained to you about the deep sea. The same is true for the open waters. 95% of the open sea we have not explored yet. Of around 200,000 sea mounds ex that exist, we have explored only like 35 to 40. So we need more knowledge and more understanding. And our possibilities, technically spoken, have developed. You see here famous ship Polarstern. But actually, regarding the knowledge we gained, there's not so much difference compared to the 19th century. This is the Challenger, the first the first uh, exploration of the deep sea, for example, only a couple of hundred years ago, we have not learned so much more so far. Because of that, the so-called United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development has defined seven goals we need, we shall achieve by the end of the decade, based on many of the challenges I just explained. And to make it short, the goal is to have, by the end of the decade, a clean ocean that is healthy and resilient, that supports us with the ecosystem services we need, that is productive, 
and this that is also predictable we have to understand causes and reactions and that is also safe and accessible and i like also goal number seven because inspiring and engaging means that we need to feel it also emotionally again we need to get connected again to what we depend on us in our company at force um, we focus on some of them because it's clear that no single organization will be able to reach these goals but you can decide or you can think about where you can contribute and with us it's the clean ocean productive ocean and the inspiring and engaging oceans and i brought with me a couple of examples especially of startups we either work with or we support and what i want to show you is that there are a lot of possibilities across different industries to positively contribute and there are some good ideas but there are also some business models that um, are quite established already on the top left um, you see an example from aquaculture we developed the business model for vera maris this is a joint venture of dsm and devonic and what they try to do is they try to make aquaculture become more sustainable by replacing fish oil through algal oil and they have the power to change around 50 percent of the global aquaculture market and this can really make a difference so this is the decoupling of aquaculture from marine resources on the bottom left you see an example from energy production where we worked with Electrohea. they produce sustainable gas based on archaea archaea is um, maybe the oldest living form on earth um, many of you are familiar with eukaryotes higher living forms and maybe also with bacteria but not with archaea actually this is how life developed and uh, these organisms in this case produce methane that can be used then also for energy supply a completely different industry is sports i brought it with me because uh, here we help support the THV Kiel a famous and, and uh, successful handball club in germany they are connected to the ocean because in Kiel they're close to the shoreline and they got engaged in different protecting uh, projects but the interesting, here, uh, the interesting thing here is that they try to activate also the fan base so here it's about inspiring people and this is something most companies cannot do because they reach all kinds of age classes, educational backgrounds, etc. So, and they can load it up emotionally. And then we have three more examples from startups. Uh, we support uh, more on a communication basis, giving them platforms like Everwave, who try to beat marine pollution by cleaning up um, rivers and oceans. Um, then on the top right, Wild, um, who develop and market sustainable period products uh, made from seaweed. And on the bottom right, Cargo Kite, who try to make or contribute to a more sustainable logisti logistics um, using emission-free microcargo ships that are pulled by these, um, by these sails. And um, so this is a variety of different innovations and startups. And we always know it's a hard way to make that, to scale them up and make them economically successful. But it was very nice to see also here at the Impact Festival that there are so many good ideas and maybe you have one too. So in the last minutes, I would like to give you some inspiration what you can do right after the session. So it's easy to try reduce and purchase on, um, to reduce the purchase of single use plastics. And I mean, us here, we live in our bubble. I think all of us, we are aware of this, but maybe can inspire and motivate also others to do so. Um, and the same is uh, true for um, uh, for seafood. So try to buy sustainably and locally sourced seafood. When possible, choose organic pr products because um, they reduce uh, the overfertilization of the ocean. Leave nothing behind. This should be self-explaining when you visit the sea. Minimize your carbon footprint. Educate yourself and others. Inspire them. Encourage effective ocean policy support ocean-friendly business practices participate in and uh, organize for example beach cleanups you can do it also at rivers and lakes support marine protected areas this is very important because we need this network of protected areas as explained before 
And what you definitely can do is donate to organizations that protect the ocean, because in the end, we come from the ocean, as I said. Um, somebody once said, we are a bag of seawater that has grown legs, arms and a head, but we still carry the sea with us. This is also true for the nutrient composition, for the nutrient stichometry inside us. It still resembles very much the nutrient stichometry we find in the seas. So now for the end, in the last minutes, we would like to invite you to think how would you like and how will you contribute? And we will do this by using Mentimeter and um, I would invite every one of you to use your mobiles and either scan in this QR code or visit www.menti.com and then insert the code 42841449. Easier way is use the code, otherwise use your browser. And the only question I would like you to answer, how will you contribute to protect our oceans? I won't comment it. We will just leave it running and hopefully it will inspire you, yourself and also others. And uh, Timo, if I may ask you to switch. Yes, thank you very much. We see the first comments, first ideas. And as said, I won't comment it, but stand it, um, read it for yourselves. So thank you very much for your ideas, for your commitment and have a nice afternoon and create positive impact.